Street Life Ministries is a Christ-following nonprofit that serves homeless folks on the Mid Peninsula. We meet really interesting people, and today we'd like to share one of those with you. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Street Life Ministries uh, podcast with a really good friend of mine, Tim Moon, um, Street Life Ministries Hello. worship leader and director and uh, all around awesome guy that I've <laughs> known for many years through recovery. And um, I met you through recovery, actually, right. yeah. uh, which we'll get into in a little bit. But I want to yeah. um, start us off in prayer. Okay. And so we'll just pray over our, our yeah. time and then we'll, yeah. we'll get started. So, Lord, thank you uh, for this time with Tim and, and myself, God. And I, and I pray that our conversation uh, edifies you and blesses you and, and, and uh, promotes you, God. You, you, are, you are the one that is in charge of all things, God. Thank you so much for uh, Tim Moon and the m- many years of, of beautiful Christian worship that he has uh, performed and sung to thousands of people, God. And I pray that today's uh, podcast that we record, that when people hear uh, his testimony and the things that he has to share will uh, speak volumes into people's lives. And maybe this will be a moment where people reach out to you and re- either recommit their lives to Christ or um, start asking questions about having a, a relationship for their first time with you, God. So we pray a blessing upon all that listen to this today and, and we ask for blessings upon our, our uh, conversation. So we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, okay, Tim. So I've known you. I've been clean and sober for 15 years. Oh. I've known you probably 13 of those 15. Yeah. Met you through higher power. Yeah. Through a mutual mm-hmm. friend of ours, Teresa Sheets. Yep. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, you yeah. are a standalone, <laughs> uh, a unique yeah. uh, kind of uh, guy yeah. that, yeah. Uh, that uh, an all one man band, mm-hmm. uh, except for when you when you have other guys play with you oh, or yeah. folks play with you, but. Um, Always more fun that way. I have others join. That, that's true. That's true. I think the first <laughs> couple of times I ran into you were uh, like all like one man band, yep. the harmonica, mm-hmm. guitar, and yeah. vocals. Yeah. And I yeah. thought, wow, this guy's this guy's legit. Um, tie dye. Yeah. Always yeah. got the tie dye. Always got yeah. the bell bottoms. Always yeah. got the sandals. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. And so, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, just all around warm hearted uh, guy. Yeah. So well, thank you. Yeah. Tell me, um, so, so let's just get us started just to kind of tell us a little bit. So where were you born and raised? Well, I was born in the late fifties down in a little town of Los Banos, California. I call it the armpit of California. <laughs> the armpit. <laughs> it's pretty much farming land and dairy, dairy farms, lots of dairy farms. But anyway, I was born there. But then when I was um, about seven or eight months old, my mom and dad, my dad was a school teacher. And he got a paying teaching job up in the San Jose area. So we loaded up the truck and moved to San Jose. And so I grew up in East Side San Jose with all the gangs. And we had you know, high school, James Lake High School, we had cowboys, gang members, um, you know, even some of my buddies that were the cowboys, they actually have the gun racks in their trucks with the guns in them. Now they weren't loaded, but you know, so that was a different time than nowadays. <laughs> Showing up at school with a gun was, you know, but that was back in the seventies and early seventies. You can, you know, anyway, but, um, so yeah, so I went to James Lake high school and was supposed to graduate in, in 70, 76, but I was one of those musicians that wanted to go make my mark in music. So I traveled down to LA a lot over the weekends and stuff and um, did a lot of music. And I actually grew up in a Christian home. My mom and dad were Christians were um, the, the keyboard players of the church. We had a piano and an organ and th- they would play that. My dad played accordion too. So, so, and they didn't really like to have drums and guitar in the church I grew up in. So I really, when I played my guitar, I had to play it at the rescue mission or out on the street. So that's kind of what got me hooked on playing out in the streets was, um, being, not being able to play at church, but being able to go to, and so, and my mom and dad were real involved with the rescue mission. We went down there, you know, through the through the '60s, and as we, um, there's I have two bro- two younger brothers, and we all played instruments, and we go down to the rescue mission, and, and mostly just play and sing. My dad wasn't a preacher, so but we could do music and sing, so, so yeah. that's what we did. Yeah, and so um, then how, how old were you when you first realized that you liked music? <laughs> Very early age. I mean, my mom even says when I was, you know, hardly, you know, probably three and four years old. Anytime there was a radio with music playing, I would <laughs> gravitate toward it. We had a piano in the house, and I was always putting my... I played piano a little bit, but 
those are too hard to carry around back in those days because they didn't have the electronic ones. So guitar was my main instrument. But yeah, but I was very young, you know, three or four years old when I, and then seven, seven, uh, eight, seven and eight year old, I really started getting into instruments. I found some instruments actually in my dad's closet, found a clarinet and um, picked that up and was, you know, just in a couple months, I was able to play a song or whatever. And so then I joined up in the elementary school, you know, band thing and played, you know, clarinet and saxophone and flute all through the you know, elementary, junior high and high school and stuff. And high school is when I really took off to start playing guitar and harmonica and stuff. But yeah, of course, wanted to play rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. But um, the church wouldn't allow that either. So, but that's, you know, that's what I found going to the rescue mission and going to the streets was that I could play the style of music that I like to play. And what is that? And, um, rock and roll with the Christian emphasis. Yeah. So who, so who was your, like, so in the, 60s and 70s. Who who was your influence? Well, actually, an older gentleman by the name of guy by the name of Woody Guthrie. Woody Guthrie was probably my first, and he wrote the song "This Land Is Your Land," and he just wrote songs about the farming communities of the of the United States. And that really, because I, I grew up in a farming family, my grandparents were farmers and came from Oklahoma to California to be builders and also to have farmland here in California and so that's so I love those songs that he would write about and so those so those are some of the earlier songs of course Bob Dylan came along kind of changed it up for me and started getting <laughs> a little bit more um, in the political thing and whatever but you know but and, and he has such great song great way of writing and whatever and so yeah so Bob Dylan and and yeah I liked Elvis but he really I knew I couldn't sing like Elvis or, or move like Elvis, so, you know, so it was one of those things where I kind of, you know, I didn't try to ever be Elvis. I wanted to be more Bob Dylan-ish or Neil Young or, you know, some of those, the birds and, you know, a little bit in the Beatles, but not too much. They were, um, they were too um, um, England for me then, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then I wanted to be as far musically and stuff, so. But, yeah. But I had a lot of, you know, great people. A lot um, of albums, huh? Yeah, you know, a lot of albums. And then in the late 60s, I met a guy by the name of Larry Norman. Yeah, and he was opening for Janis Joplin at the time, so I got to. Of course, I had no idea who she was because I was just a young teenager at the time. And sure, didn't know who she was as far as you know. And then a few years later, she passed away and stuff. And so, so but, for um, somebody who might be listening that that doesn't know, but I do. Yeah, who's so who's Larry Newman? Larry Norman. Um, Norman. He's, yeah. he's the guy. Well, back in 1968, he came out with the so-called first. Christian rock album where there was guitars and drums and lead guitar solos and stuff and just that that style of rock. I listen to it nowadays and it seems so tame. It's like you know it's not it's not any different than the church music nowadays. But back in those days, it was really different. And so you know, and he grew up in San Jose. He and so I you know he went to high school in San Jose and then there was a. Um, Randy Stonehill also grew up in San Jose. Randy actually went to the same high school my wife did. And mm. um, when he was a senior, she was, um, I think she was a freshman or something like that when he was a senior. So, yeah, so, um, you know, and I remember him playing at the local Hootenanny kind of places, you know, that they would have in and around San Jose. And, and then, um, you know, and then there was a guy named Terry Scott Taylor, great songwriter, group Daniel Amos, and he grew up in San Jose. So there was these three icon people that I just really gravitated towards, and they were just, you know, knowing that they came from San Jose, you know, that just made it all the, the more um, stuff. And then the people like Barry McGuire would come through um, and play in San Francisco and, and San Jose and stuff. And he did that big song hit um, in 65 called Eva Destruction. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing is probably more of a prophecy now than it was back in 1965. Interesting. Stuff. So it's, it's actually a song that gets requested a lot when I play out on the streets. They really want to hear Eva Destruction. So, yeah. yeah. So, so you so you started playing on the streets, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, just, just for people to hear you, to make money, a little well, bit of just, both? Just a little bit of both. Um, mainly, like, well, the biggest thing was I kind of started more in the rescue mission. And there I had a captive audience because they had to sit through a, a church service of music and and preaching before they could eat. And so, yeah, so that's kind of, so my mom and dad would take us to those, mainly my dad. He would play accordion and us, um, my, me and my brothers would sing and play our instruments and then they could go eat. So there, you know, but then, then my dad got to a point where he didn't want to go that much and I wanted to go more. So I even would ride my bike when I was 14 or 15. We only lived 
a few miles from the rescue mission. So I'd hop on my bike and go down the rescue mission, just kind of hang out. And there'd be a guitar down there or something. That was before I actually owned a guitar. But there'd be a guitar down there and they had a piano and stuff that I would sit at and play a few things on the piano or, you know, pick up the guitar and stuff. And so that's what I, you know, that's what um, that's started cool. there playing, you know, when I was 14, 15, 16 years old. And then when I was 16, I got day after I turned 16 on Sunday and Monday morning I was at DMV and got my driver's license and started, you know, then I was able, I had a car already, so, so it was, um, I was um, doing some odd jobs and stuff, so. Yeah. And then, um, so I was able to drive and then, you know, and then found out that, you know, people would actually pay to, for me to play and so then I started playing at places like the Oasis in downtown San Jose and I would play just, you know, just the top 40 songs and Bob Dylan songs and Woody Guthrie songs and, you know, doing that when I was 16, 17, 18. So that's pretty good you know, exposure, so, huh? Right, yeah. So we'd do Friday, so Friday and Saturday nights, I would do paid shows there where I'd actually make a hundred bucks. And then, you know, of course, my mom and dad says, if you're going to do that on Friday and Saturday, you got to be at church Sunday morning at 9 a.m. So, you know, so then I would play at church also. But at church, I mainly played, we play saxophone. And that was another instrument that I did a lot of and so so I played that a lot and then didn't play my guitar much in church just because people were still kind of <laughs> oh, yeah, one you know yeah. it's too too rock and roll for them yeah um but anyway so so but I was very influenced by a um, family of musicians and stuff, that's awesome so, yeah so when when how old were you when you started to put together your first band well I, we had a little band called Joyful Noise and that's about what we did was Joyful Noise <laughs> um but it's mainly my my cousin Tammy she was a singer and she always wanted to sing, and so, and we had a really good piano player. Um, his name was Rusty. So he played the piano, and I mostly played saxophone back then, but I did play a little bit of guitar. Once in a great while, she would let me lead lead a song and sing, but she didn't really, she goes, Tim, you can't sing. <laughs> so anyway, but anyway, so um, anyway, that was one of the things that, you know, we used to kind of fight about. But then I'd go to the mission, or go to the streets, and people loved my voice. But I'd play, I would sing at church, and they say, you know, you can't sing. And a lot of times, though, I found out later, it's more the the things that I was singing about that they didn't like. Oh, it was, it. Uh, you know, because there was a song that Larry wrote um, back in the late 60s called um, Why Don't You Look Into Jesus? And so the, the verse goes, sipping whiskey from a paper cup, drying your sorrows so you can't stand up. Well, that line was written about Janis Joplin. And I, being a teenager in in the church, I knew that, we were all experimenting, you know, with alcohol and, and some of them drugs and stuff. And so I knew that song would fit perfectly in the youth group, but it didn't set well with the elders. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so they, you know, they said, you know, so the board said I had to submit lyrics before I could sing again. So <laughs> that's hilarious. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so, uh, so you about in your 20s, 30s, you're, you're, just kind of humming along, playing, still doing Rescue Mission. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You got that, a band. That was, yeah. And I have a band, yeah, and stuff. And so I, and it's mostly, I didn't have a steady band. I just had musician friends. And when I was going to go do something significant, um, either play at a festival or play, you know, at the streets of San Francisco, I would call up to me, my musician friends, about 20, 20 different people, and i say, who can come, you know? And so then I said, and, you know, and then I would, Lucy would call the band Tim Moon and the Stars, but we never did really advertise like that or whatever. And so it'd be Tim Moon, and then these were all my stars that would come along and hang out and whatever and stuff. And so, and then, um, and then in about, um, well, let's see, it's jump, you know, through the 80s, I, actually, my, when me and my wife got married in 1980 and stuff. And so, and then the kids started coming in 82. So we have two boys and two girls. And so, um, you know, so this like, okay, here I'm trying to be a musician and trying to make a living and really wasn't making much money. So then I decided I would work. I worked a little bit in the um, in, um, electronic field, mainly because I knew how to solder things because I was always repairing my own equipment. And, you know, so I knew how to solder and wire things and, you know, what they call um, point wiring, ABC wiring and stuff. And so I would do a lot of that. And stuff, but the companies, it seemed like every company that I would join, three or four, six months later, they were bought out by another company. I get laid off. Oh. <laughs> so this happened all through the 80s of getting a job, working for six months to a year, and then getting laid off, and then, you know, and then trying to do music again. So music was always there, you know, even when I worked 
music every evening. You know, I'd be out playing music somewhere or whatever. So yeah, 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 that's really and, in um, your heart. Oh yeah, yeah, and still doing the rescue mission and playing at church and whatever. M didn't do much club playing back then just because I didn't like the atmosphere and it really wasn't worth making the, the hundred bucks. I'd rather go, you know, and do something a little bit more positive. And then, um, yeah, and so then um, in um, the late, I'm trying to think it was in the ni early 90s, there was a um, church in San Jose called the Home Church, and they started a coin, a coffee house. Um, and um, I better turn my phone off before we go any further so that I don't get a ring that... <laughs> um, get um, called Coinia Coffee House with KKK. -K -K. K and Koine and K and coffee. And um, so that was every Friday night. And so that gave me a, a place to play almost every Friday night and a place to hang out with other musicians. And so my good friend, Mike Dow, um, started that and stuff. And, and um, it's, it ran for about 16 years and then it closed down, but um, it was a great place to meet musicians and stuff. Then there was other coffee houses that popped up. One thing I probably should go back to the 70s is that there was a coffee house called the Lighthouse that was out on Monterey Highway that people used to come there and Bear McGuire played there, Larry Norman played there, a lot of other people. And then myself, I got to, that was one of the first times I got to play at a coffee house with a real stage and kind of like, instead of playing in the club, it was a nice place right. to play and, and whatever. And then um, there was a place called the Upper Room um, that was downtown, um, a guy by the name of Conrad Cooper used to run that and then there was um, also the 24-hour hotline that we had for teenagers to call in about um, suicide, suicidal wow. things and stuff and so we were in charge of that and would answer phones and yeah, you know, we didn't make any money but he would, you know, Conrad was good about buying us lunch and meals when we needed to eat and whatever so yeah, but um, yeah, That's but cool. that was cool times, you know, yeah. and then another place called Jacob's Ladder, you know, and so there was a lot of little places, but none of them stuck around. Koinia was the only one that really stuck around for years and stuff, and then, um, right. yeah, and then there was one up in San Mateo called Common Grounds, and um, there was a coffee house and stuff, yeah. and I'm trying to remember some of the other places, but it slipped my mind, but anyway, but that kind of was all through the 80s, so, and they were actually paid the musicians to come and play the bands sure, and stuff, sure. and so, yeah. So over the but, years, you've also, one of the things, you know, I um, to, I don't know, call it bragging or whatever. But what, one of the things I know that over the years, I mean, you've worked around some pretty, yeah. pretty big names. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah. what what is how, what what is somebody like you? How does that? How does that happen? Like, how do you? Is it just being at the right place at the right time, or is it just that? And you know, like well, especially my relationship with Larry, with Larry Norman. He, um, you know, he he had my home phone number and stuff. And he he lived down in L.A. and he'd want to come to San Jose. Well, his family lived in San Jose. Well, <laughs> a lot of times he didn't want to see his family right away, so he'd call me, you know, like the week before and say, "Hey, I'm going to fly in." And I don't want to go see my family. I want you to pick me up at the airport. And I want to go hide out in a hotel and see some of my friends and just kind of hang out for a little bit before I see my family. And so, you know, and not that he hated his family. It's just that families have a way of sucking the life out of you because they want to know this, they want to know that, and all that kind of stuff. But he just wanted to come and relax. It was actually only a place where he could come and relax. He loved to go over Santa Cruz and spend a day or two at Santa Cruz and stuff. And so I was his ride and stuff. And so that's mainly how it happened. Is that you know I'd go pick him up at the airport and we'd take off for a couple of days and and so um you know and then also I was really good friends with his dad and at that time in the early seventies they um, a lot of the bio bookstores wouldn't carry his records because they were too rock and roll and then Tower Records and some of those other secular record companies said he was too Christian. So they wouldn't carry his records. Wow. So he ended up having to make his records, ship them to his dad's house in San Jose. I mean, they were in his dad's garage. And so one day we're sitting there and it's like, his name is Joe. Joe Norton says, you realizing you're running an underground <laughs> Christian record company in your, <laughs> in your house? You know, and it's like, you never, you know. And here he was, a very staunch Christian guy on the board of directors and you know, the right, church right. and whatever. And it's like... No, but anyway, so with you know, and then met people like um, Bill Ayers, who became um, Larry's manager for a number of years and stuff. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah, so because of my connection with Larry, it just kind of opened the doors to be friends with Randy Stonehill and Terry Scott Taylor and 
Barry McGuire, when they found out, you know, when those people would find out that they also knew me. And in fact, it's kind of funny because about 12, well, no, it's been longer than that, probably 15 years ago, Barry McGuire, Chuck Gerard, Phil Keggy, uh, Randy Stonehill, was it Brian Duncan? Brian Duncan. We're all riding on a bus in Alaska. And they're all tied. They're going to go meet this this boat where they're going to take a cruise and they were going to be the entertainment for the cruise. Mm -hmm. And so they're all there talking and they all, they're all talking about their different experiences and name comes up. My name comes up amongst all these guys. And I have relationships with all of them as far as being their friend whenever they come to San Jose. And so then, so uh, Phil gets on the phone and he calls me. And so he says, Hey, they, and so we, they passed the phone around and put me on speakerphone to talk to, all of my buddies on this trip wow. on the bus. And so, so it's like a dream come true of, um, of hanging out with my, with my buddies and, and stuff like that. So then, you know, as they get to know you and you get to know them and then they, and then also the, the road managers, like, especially with groups like newsboys and audio adrenaline and, um, David Crowder, you get acquainted with the road manager cause, um, they want to know that you will do what you say you will do. Cause a lot of times, the bands like to go and sneak off and do stuff, you know, that they don't have time for, like go see a movie. Uh -huh. I mean, and um, there are some bands that are notorious. They want to go see a movie. Well, it's a two and a half hour long movie and they only have an hour of time. Right. So it's like they got to get back to the venue and stuff. And so a lot of times, you know, they knew that me as taking them there, that I would get them back to the uh, venue on time. <laughs> so I learned to learn to funny. talk to the management, and that's one thing. The management ended up, you know, saying, "Okay, Tim's a good guy to take. Let them go to a supermarket or go to the mall or go to the movie because he'll get them back in time for the sound check and all that kind of stuff." So yeah, so, yeah, yeah I know because my family has actually benefited from some of that relationship <laughs> with some of the concert tickets you've given, yeah, yeah, well, like, given my wife and and, and also oh, yeah. Vio and yeah. stuff. I know. Well, yeah, so, I'm hoping to do more of that, but this year has been kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, been so, really crazy. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Um, kind of go fast forward. So like the last, um, so like then I met you at mm -hmm. Higher Power. Yep. From mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a Christian recovery meeting. Right. What What got you into um, doing more um, uh, recovery houses? Because that's I, that's where you're in the you're kind of like the the leader of like <laughs> the recovery. Christian recovery music. I, everywhere yeah. I go, you're there. <laughs> well, you know, it, it stems back from being at the rescue mission and just wanting so badly. Even though me personally, yeah, I, I had my dabbles when I was in high school with drugs and alcohol. But I, I learned early on it wasn't for me. I had sure. too many friends that would drink too much and do drugs too much, end up dying. Like one year I had eight friends die within four months of each other. Of either yeah. drug overdose or accident related to alcohol or drugs. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, you know, so it's like, now I was 16 at the time, and it's like, man, I just, I can't go down that. So it's like, now I got to try to figure out how to rescue these people. <laughs> so, right. so I just kind of felt, well, I could do that through the music. And so then when the recovery thing started 30 years ago, um, and higher power and around the Bay Area, I was like, man, this is a place where I can go do some music and do some good. And even in the coffee house scenes and whatever. And I think churches, they don't really know what to do with these people in recovery. <laughs> and, you know, because they, you know, they want them to come to church, of course, but then they don't really know how to deal with the day-to-day -day issues. And so I just figured, well, I'll set my mind to play music that they can relate to and that they can benefit from in their walk, you know. You know, yeah, if there's so one, so. if there's one thing I know for a fact, I've been sober for 15 years, mm -hmm. and uh, leading this ministry, I have mm -hmm. a lot of personal relationship with churches. Uh -huh. You know, there's one thing I've learned: ch church leaders <laughs> do not know how to work with addicts. Right. And when somebody's sober mm -hmm. and they and they're working a program, an addict. In a, that's working a rigorous 12-step program mm -hmm. is so honest. Oh, yeah. And they're so transparent. They scare people in the church. Yeah, exactly. Because they don't, they can't, they don't know how to handle that right. much honesty. Yeah. You know, I mean, I know, I know that's, I know that's <laughs> probably going to upset some people that are going to hear this. Yeah. Um, well, uh, but I will say that I have, I have watched church people mm -hmm. get uncomfortable around mm -hmm. somebody oh, that's yeah. working a really honest, rigorous program because right. they're very transparent. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, been my thing every, every pastor that I've served under I've told them I says you 
as the pastor, need to go through the 12 steps. And then they usually don't, but, you know, yeah. I'll give them the book or whatever, and they'll, sure. you know, thumb through it or whatever. But it's like, I think if every pastor and every church leader would do the 12 steps, their their ministry would just soar and they would be, you know. I think that if, I think that every church member, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people go to, uh, BSF and all right. these things for 20, 30 years. And mm -hmm. they and, and I'm not knocking those programs because right. I think they're awesome. Mm -hmm. But I think every church member should spend one year going through the 12 steps. Right. Get a yeah. sponsor, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. work a program, mm -hmm. yep. and uh, and and they but they won't do it. Yeah. They yeah. think, well, but I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not a drug addict. I go, no, but you're a sinner. <laughs> yeah. And that and 12 then, steps is really just oh, about yeah. your, about yeah. sins. My, I, you know, my alcohol and drugs that I recover from, mm -hmm. they weren't the problem. Yeah. The problem was everything else that was making me self-medicate. Right. You know? Yeah, well, that's what I think of. As, 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 well, when that happened in 16, then it took me a couple of years. Before I, 18 or 19, I had a couple of friends that were having problems with alcohol. So I told them, I said, I will go to the AA meetings with you when I was um, 18 and 19 years old. I started just going just to be just to be support for them. And then I would hear all these stories and it's like, oh, wow, you know, no wonder, you know, people are so messed up and, you mm -hmm. know, and so, and then that's one thing I found that people were so honest at the, these AA meetings that they were almost too honest sometimes. <laughs> Right, you know, all the stuff right. they say. And then, of course, they use a lot of color. And I tried to bring a couple of church people with me that kind of, knew, you know, I knew they had issues, not necessarily with alcohol or whatever, but they just had and get them to come. And, you know, and they would always say, well, we can't stand the foul language. Well, it's like, you know, because that's when the NAA, they do a lot of, you know, they explain themselves in very colorful ways. Yeah. But, you know, and I think, you know, but it, it's one of those things I think every Christian person should, you know, I agree. should do the 12 steps and you know, whether we get that or yeah but anyway yeah but getting back that's how i got involved with the recovery was i went to these aa meetings and it's like but you know that's one thing that's one thing i like about the the celebrate recovery and the recovery meetings at r and r and higher power and some of the other churches are doing the bridge and some of the others are doing they add a mute the music element to it which that's where i come in and stuff and so it was really awesome to have that and then actually, you know, get you know, get paid for doing some of that kind of stuff and whatever. And sure. The, and the people want to hear more about your ministry, and they hear about SOS Ministries that I've been a part of for. Uh, yeah, explain 40. explain that a little bit for people. So yeah, SOS is a street ministry that we we pass out tracks and we preach on the streets of San Francisco and Berkeley. I mean, that's our main two focuses is San Francisco and Berkeley. But um, we just go out, we get a permit to set up a sound system, and we're out there for four or five hours just praying for people and street preaching, and then music comes, you know, because we're, you don't want to preach for five and a half hours, but it's nice to have some music and then somebody preaching and then more music and stuff. But it's a, one of those things that we hand out thousands of tracts and hundreds of Bibles and that we give away and pray with a lot of people. And and it's it's like, you know, we don't see the, the results right away, but we'll get letters from people. Um, we got a letter from a lady in Europe, you know, 20 something years ago, you know, she came her came to, Calif um, came to California and visited San Francisco and she ended up getting saved and her whole family got saved uh, you know, 20 years ago. And because we'd given her a Bible, you know, on the streets of San Francisco and she went back to England and, you know, and stuff. And so you never hear about these things until they write to us years later and saying because of you i'm a christian today so you know so, that's pretty powerful yeah yeah and then i also know a lot of street musicians in and around san francisco and there's one kid named richard who great guitar player and stuff he's um at the time when i first met him he was 20 years old al alcoholic or drug addict on the streets also some some prostitute being a male prostitute and stuff and so he had a nice guitar, and then one day he came up, and his guitar was all in shambles, and he, he was holding his arm, and he got in a fight, and they tore up his guitar and dislocated his shoulder. Oh, wow. And so I said, would you mind, and he would always say, I don't believe in your God, I don't want to hear about God, I don't want to hear about Jesus, I don't want to hear, you know, I said, well, Richard, can I pray for you? And he says, well, I guess so. He said, you know, I don't, you know, I, so I laid my hand on his shoulder, and an hour later, he comes running back. And he says, Tim, and he was raising his hand up over his shoulder because God healed him. And he says, see, God, it doesn't matter to God whether you believe, but I believe, and I have enough faith for you to you know, get healed. Right, right. So then, and then a week later, I said, you come back next week. We're going to be in the same spot. You come back. And so I went and picked up a, a, a little expensive guitar 
and the next week I gave it to him. And then the follow and also the other thing is I would always talk to him about getting into, you know, Teen Challenge or into um, City Team. And sure. He got into City Team and went through the year-long program, and now he's back in Texas with his family, and he's married now, and he's a youth pastor at a church in Texas. Are you serious? <laughs> wow. Yeah. So wow. Do you ever him. have contact with him? Not lately. I haven't heard from him in the last about last ten years. But you know, but that's I'm sure wild. Can. Yeah. So I, See, I figured that's, that's, know, no that's the kind of stuff. No, I like yeah, here. no, no. I figure no news is good news. I'm hoping that because we're planning to go to Texas, our daughters, our young, our youngest daughter is expecting a, her first baby, and they live in Texas. And uh, while well, I'm in Texas um, in the month of May and part of June. I'm hoping to go see him. He's down in the Austin area. I'm hoping to go down there. And I also have a cousin that's pastors a church in Austin, so I'm going to go down there and see him and yeah, um, stuff. But yeah, but I, I probably should talk about my family. I have four kids. They're all musical. They all play on worship teams. They're all, you know, especially my two sons are guitar players and singers and stuff. And so they, uh, so I'm very proud of them. And I'm a grandpa four times, starting to be a fifth, my fifth grandchild wow. on the way and stuff. So, been married to Sue for 41 years. <laughs> That's awesome. And so, you know, so she's put and, up with you for 41 oh, years. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, it's like a lot of people ask us, you know, how that happened, and I said, well, it's her fault. <laughs> Every time I come home, she's there. She's still there. Anyway, <laughs> but it's one of those things that you know, I I go that only you know, absent makes the heart grow fonder. But no, I really have to say heads up to Sue because if it wasn't for her, I really wouldn't be able to do what I do and stuff. Sure. And we wouldn't have the kids serving God the way they they do and stuff because it's mainly her prayers and her yeah. um, her steadfastness of faithfulness and stuff too. And your mom and dad both still alive? Yeah, they're both still alive. They're they're having some health issues, but they're both um, one's my my dad's eighty four and my mom's eighty three. That's wild. You know, but yeah, and my dad's still working in his farm. You know, drives a tractor two or three times a, a day, and you know, and, you know, likes to get out and pull weeds and stuff. And he shouldn't, but he still does, and he does still some bookkeeping and tax work for people and stuff. So yeah, but anyway, but he's still doing that. So, yeah. So, but, yeah, so they're doing good, and um, yeah, and then we we live in a um, mobile home behind their place and stuff. So we, I'm kind of their their caregiver and try to fix some breakfast every morning and you know spend some time with them and stuff. So yeah, that's you know, good. So, yeah, yeah. But, and uh, and currently you play worship for Street Life Ministries. Yeah, yeah. A few years ago, uh, Mr. Dave David called me up and says, "Hey, man, we want you to come on board." And I says, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of, I can't remember exactly what I said, but I said, well, paycheck would be nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and what, you know, and I sell so days, they, they, you know, so you guys started, you know, helping me out a little bit each month and stuff. And so now here, you know, here it is a few years later and things are going great. It's pretty cool. I have a full, um, I have about, I counted the other day, 30, 32 musicians that I can call, that, you know, and, you know, some of them, you know, some of them are real faithful and some are just kind of once in a while, but, you know, that, you know, that are on our team yeah. to lead worship and just be a part of what, you know, and that's not only just street church, but that's also other avenues that I do, like either the recovery centers or go to San Francisco and play in San Francisco and yeah. stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, I remember uh, a couple of years ago, it's been about, what has it been, about, about five years, six yeah. years now? Yeah. So yeah. I remember... Yeah. So Bruce Squires, mm -hmm. who yeah. unfortunately passed away a right. years ago, yeah. which is a tragic loss, yes, yeah. um, was our director of operations. Mm -hmm. Really good man, mm -hmm. you know. I, um, yeah, ex-military. Yeah. You know, he's the guy was the guy was just phenomenal. Yeah, you know, and I, just such a tragic loss mm -hmm. to, to lose oh, yeah. him all of a sudden the way we yeah. the way we lost him. Yeah, you know, and I feel so sad for his yeah. late wife that mm -hmm. you know. They had just got married. You know, they weren't even married for a year. Right. Yeah. When he just passed a few away. Months, yeah, yeah. And I just, oh, yeah. I just, yeah. I never, I'll never forget the phone call. Yeah. yeah. But, um, you know, he, he, you know, he came to Street Church and and Menlo Park, mm -hmm. and we had a couple things that he didn't like. <laughs> One, we had a couple rough mm -hmm. alcoholics yeah. that were yeah. that were always disrespecting the message. Right. Yeah. And uh, we tried really hard to always kind of keep it down. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, and we had no worship. Right. We had no music, and and we had every now and then we'd get. I remember that guy. Um, what was the one guy's name that he played acoustic guitar with his girlfriend or wife? I think oh, it's his wife now. But yeah, yeah, Mark or Mike or something yeah, like that. Yeah. But they but they always no no 
no mm-hmm. amplification, yeah. and you couldn't hear him over the train. And right, yeah. yeah. And Bruce looks at me. He says, "He says I will get. I will make sure that we have respect during the message mm-hmm. if you can get worship." And yeah. I remember going, "Huh." So I was praying about that, yeah. and then your name came up in a conversation yeah. uh, with Teresa. Mm-hmm. I was talking to Teresa, and Teresa mm-hmm. said, you know what, why don't you call Tim Moon and see? And I go, yeah, but he you know, he, li- he lives all the way south of San Jose, <laughs> and like, I, mean, I don't know. And then, um, yeah, and then you started driving all the way up here and mm-hmm. playing worship yeah. with us. And, yeah. and then uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we ended up with worship like almost every single Tuesday and Thursday for a while, and right. then we ended up with... Now we got a full rotation, and, right? Yeah, and then Redwood City got dialed in, and now mm-hmm. our site in Palo Alto, and yeah, and um, you know, I always, I, I know this sounds kind of uh, harsh to say this, but it's the only, the only real way I know how to kind of describe it, is that you know they say magic, oh, magic. They say, <laughs> I don't believe in magic. Sorry, um, they say that music soothes the the savage beast, yeah. and. Uh, and I say that with with actually kind of like, you know, with a smile on my face because I think like, you know, the enemy mm-hmm. wants to always constantly cause disruption. And I noticed that once you started playing worship, that the disruption that we were getting from the folks that were showing up yeah. started to slowly dissipate. Right. And I know now how important worship is. Yeah. Well, and also showing up early to get it started before the other folks show up. So they're already a presence of God, you know, through the music is already there, you know, even though God's spirit is everywhere, but it's nice having music to usher in, you know, the presence of the Lord. So that as the, um, the folks from all over come and gather and then the staff starts showing up and stuff and everybody's in a good mood and they're all greeting each other with hellos rather than, you know, <laughs> being mad or whatever. Yeah. You Plus know, you're, so you know what I like about your style of music for anybody who... Um, is interested and here's his podcast if they want a CD because yeah. you have CD yeah. um, if anybody wants a CD just leave a message yeah. for us sure. and um, I will make sure that I get you a CD I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll buy your CD and, um, and send it to yeah. you but and, yeah. um, but what I noticed is that what I like, like about your music is it's not like the old school hem, hemnal worship music yeah. which mm-hmm. The songs are, but they're but they're but they're rock and roll. Yeah, but yeah. and they're and they're kind of moody blues or kind of like uh, like Bob Dylan, mm-hmm. Led Zeppelin, yeah. like any any of the kind of the, the like the famous kind of like folk kind of rock and roll people that you could think of is right. your is your style. Right. Yeah. So it's danceable. Yeah. It's happy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of times what I've noticed is people come and they don't realize that they're actually worshiping. Right. Mm-hmm. And then they sit there and they listen to your words and they go, "Wow, th- that's all." Christian music, and I'm like, yeah. yeah, it sounds like the Doobie Brothers. It sounds like the, it yeah. sounds like uh, uh, Neil Neil uh, Neil Young, yeah. Neil Young, or or so. But it's or Deadheads, but it's, you know, Grateful Dead, yeah, and, you know, so, so, yeah, you know. Um, so. But yet it gets you, it gets you in the spirit, mm-hmm. yeah. and uh, and I do, I, I do believe that it does, war, it does uh, mm-hmm. rush the spirit of the Lord on the, you know, it invites the Lord there. Oh yeah, yeah. So and there, you know, and. People are able to give requests, you know, because I do, you know, I do some secular music that has a good positive meaning because there's a lot of Bob Dylan songs and even Neil Young and some of the others have some great music that are just great songs. And sometimes I'll have some of the people on the street say, we want to hear this song. And then they'll sit there and just cry because it brings back a memory of, of something for them, of their childhood or their sure. you know, their family life or whatever. And it's like... God uses that to, to minister to them. Where and that's one thing I believe in ministering where they're at, rather than just trying to say, oh, "I'm going to play this no matter what." I'm going to, you know, I kind of cater to their needs of what they want to hear. You know? Sure. So, yeah, so yeah, and that is so. that is important too. Yeah. And yeah. One thing I I will say that we, you and I, yeah. and everybody in the ministry try really hard, mm-hmm. is I was uh, I was really when I was out on the streets I was really put off mm-hmm. by um, street preacher street preachers that tried to come at me with judgment and con- right. condemnation, right? Yeah. And uh, that's one thing I like about SOS yeah. is, uh, you know, um, and other ministries like Street Life and other, mm-hmm. and uh, even Salvation Army is, yeah. is, is really good at this too, is that you're handing out tracts, you're yeah. sharing a message, you're doing worship, but you're leaving it up to the person right. to approach, approach right? Yeah. No, nobody's coming in there sho- sho- shoving a Bible down somebody's throat. Right. Yeah. And um, I think... We've noticed at Street Life, 
that we have we have been able to capture more people that are lost mm -hmm. into a position where they want to they want to know more about what is this saving grace right mm -hmm. by being just who we are just being human just mm -hmm. you know and in, in, um, in the way we preach the way right. we do our worship and stuff so yeah so, amen pretty, to pretty, that. amen to that right yeah well it's it's a great place to be you know street yeah. life and what you know and going where the people are rather than trying to get them to, to you know come to a building or come here or come there we're just going where they're at and right that's one thing that i really like about street life and, so here's a here's a question that people ask me all the time I, and, and i always kind of laugh when i get this <laughs> but i just it's, i just want to ask you so is it in, in, in what you do is there a retirement no yeah no i'm gonna i'm gonna die with a guitar in my hand playing on yeah. the street somewhere and you know yeah <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, you know, that's, you know, I had, you know, that's one thing I should mention too is I came from a long line of ministers and pastors and evangelists in my, on both sides, both my mom's side and my dad's side of the family. And, you know, I have a lot of cousins who pastor churches all, all up and down California and yeah. stuff. And so, you know, so we have a, a big heritage of, you know, none of them, I mean, they, they stopped pastoring a, a certain church, but they never stopped ministering either, you know, at, old folks' homes or rescue missions or jail ministries or prisons, they still continued to do that until they were no, you know, physically no longer able to do it. But then they would do it other ways by ministering to me or to somebody younger in the right. family to pass that along. So, you know. That, so. That's the, I, that, I couldn't have said it any better than myself. I, yeah, I, yeah, so. I tell people all the time, I'll, I'll die with a Bible in my hand standing yeah. on a street corner. Yeah. Yeah, I mean there is there is no retirement. Yeah, no. You know, until I can't until I can't get a word out of my mouth. That's yeah. pretty much well. You know, well, you know, I did have a scare in 2017 when I'm sitting in Phil Keggy's studio and my heart's not not pumping right, and all of a sudden I pass out and on his floor, you know, and I go outside and you know then get picked up by an ambulance and have you know surgery, you know. And they, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, how many stents? <laughs> Five stents. They, well, they, that was a Friday, and they put three in on Friday, and they kept me over the weekend, and on Monday they went and put in two more, two more stents and yeah. stuff. And so, yeah, so, yeah, but praise God that, you know, it's a wake-up call to me just I got to start taking care of better care of myself and stop eating like a, a rock and roll guy at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> well, what's, uh, <laughs> what was the guy that passed away that uh, all he ate was Twinkies? and Larry, Larry Norman. Yeah. yeah. He was, you know. It's a little bit debate on. I it's, I can't remember. I see because we celebrated his 60th birthday, but then I was looking at his thing, and he was only 59 when he he passed when he passed away. So it's like you know, how did we celebrate his 60? You know, anyway, I've got to figure that out. So, but anyway, yeah. But Larry was a good friend, and he and that's one thing too is he always encouraged me to continue going out onto the streets. And whenever he came to town, that was one of the one things he wanted to do. So he wanted to go to Haight Nashbury and just hang out with the people on the streets and you know, we go to Santa Cruz in the same way. You want to hang out with all the young hippie kids. Yeah. And could he, could he, when he'd go out to Haight Ashbury, could he disappear? Like nobody would know who he is. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. See, that's, that's, yeah. so that's one thing my wife and I like to do. Yeah. Cause here in the peninsula, mm -hmm. there's not anywhere I can go without being kind of recognized. Yeah. But I would go to the city mm -hmm. and I can really just serve the Lord with yeah. nobody knowing who I am. Yeah. Well, Fessy, you know, Larry didn't usually dress like a, you know, whatever. So, he, you know, and then he, he'd wear sunglasses a lot, but, he had, and he put his hair up because that's when he was noticed by his long blonde hair you know, went almost down to his, his belt. But um, sometimes he put it up in his hat, and so then you couldn't see how long his hair was. And so we walk around, you know. But then, but the other times he he didn't care, you know. But a lot of times people didn't know who he was and stuff. And cool. So, yeah. Thanks, Which, Tim. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, man. It was a pleasure. I love you, Tim. I love you too, yeah, man. Yeah, you're you're hey, an awesome guy, bro. Well, you know, I thank you for this opportunity to of a lifetime and. Being, you know, dream come true. You know, no, you've been, you're, you're there. a blessing to this ministry. Yeah, you, well. you and uh, and Mike and yeah. the PBJ brothers and all that. Yeah. But, but oh, seriously, yeah. you, you've been a blessing to this ministry. The way you've yeah. orchestrated the worship and oh yeah, and bring in that bring in that music. And I love when you get all these these girls here from Redwood oh, yeah. Church yeah. over there singing and yeah, it's a lot yeah. of fun. And I've oh, yeah. and I've I tell you, you have orchestrated some <laughs> amazing talent. Thank you. To come to the ministry to sing yeah. to our folks, and yeah. I and I know that they appreciate it because, yeah. I mean, it's just it's it's, mm. uh, record label kind of yeah. music. Oh, yeah. It's That's it's it's live concert kind of folks. I mean, like people that you would pay a lot of money to go see, mm -hmm. 
just showing up at our little rag tap little <laughs> ministry yeah. and it is fun it's yeah. it's a lot of yeah, fun to hear some yeah. of the sing, singing that comes across yeah. those microphones so oh yeah yeah they're they're very talented I, yeah i got a great team yeah so thank yeah, you yeah it's awesome so thanks a lot tim yeah all right you're welcome thank Bye. you